Tonight you're going to see an interview with Robertson Davies, and I think that there are a number of things that you should remember about him as you're looking at the interview. One is that he, in fact, leads rather two lives, I think. One is the writer, a rather private and even secretive person, as you'll see in the interview, and the other is the man of letters, the commentator, the speaker, and to use an old term, the club man, the fellow that's quite at home standing around talking to other intellectual men at a dinner table or whatever, the master of Massey College. Now, Massey College is a graduate college which was set up at the University of Toronto essentially as a residence, and it's run to a great extent on English style. And uh, there's a high table where they have a formal dinner, and they have fellows of the college, a variety of things that are very English in style, yet it's something that's very closely tied in to Canadian traditions, as in the Massey Foundation itself, which is uh, a very important part of the Canadian tradition, like Massey Hall, like Massey Ferguson, for that matter, all the same family. At one time, there was a, um, a phrase that went, Canada has no social classes, only the Masseys and the masses. So that gives you an idea of what Massey College is about. The interview took place in his office at Massey, so we are, to a certain extent, seeing the one man, that secretive private writer, in the room of the other, the master, the, um, the man of letters. In the interview, he mentioned Samuel Marchbanks, the persona, the name that he wrote under in writing his columns at one time. And note what he says very carefully, and we'll discuss more about Marchbanks in a later lecture. Another point that I want you to give special consideration to is what he says about the psychologist Carl Gustav Jung, because Jung is right at the center of Fifth Business, and we'll be talking about Jung in quite intensive detail in the last lecture and the second lecture of uh, Fifth Business. And now we'll go to the comfortable setting of the master's rooms. I guess the first question I'd like to ask you, Professor Davies, is about your experience at, at Oxford and how that experience um, affected you in your writing, in your acting, etc. Well, I don't think it affected me uh, uh, more in my writing than in anything else affected my writing. I went to Oxford after having been to the university here in uh, Canada, at Queen's University, and uh, it was uh, a different look at the uh, same sort of uh, thing that I had been working on at Queen's. It was a, a broader view of English literature, a, a different outlook, but not, uh, not radically, uh, not radically different. It was just uh, an expansion, a larger experience. Do you think that it made you any less North American than other people of your generation? No, I don't think so. Um, I don't think so at all. If anything, I think it made me uh, more North American because it gave me a chance to um, think about uh, North America and to think about Canada from a distance. And I think that's a thing that a great many Canadians do. And I think that it's uh, a good thing for them to do because it's very hard to know your own country if you only know it from living inside it and living in a li limited area of it. Uh, living in England and living abroad, I s came to know Canada as it was seen by other people. And that is a, a sanitary and interesting experience. It's uh, amazing and chilling, you know, and when you live in England for a while and find out how little Canadian news there is in the newspapers. I found the same thing. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you come back, what, you were there for five years, was it? Yes. Did you come Six back years. then? intending to come back to Canada? Was that your plan? I had intended always to come back to Canada, but uh, I didn't know precisely when I would, but it was uh, because of the war, of course. I had been working in the theater, and uh, the war came along, closed all the theaters. Uh, there was nothing for me to do, and so uh, that was when I came back to Canada. There was nothing doing for a Canadian in, uh, in England. There was no uh, war work to be done. There was no war to be seen, actually, although we were technically at war. Mm -hmm. 
Is there um, something that you would see in your progression from an actor to a to a journalist to a playwright and then to a novelist? Although I realize that the last three have been, to a certain extent, simultaneous. No, I think that they would be imposing a pattern on my life which doesn't really exist in it because you see I became a journalist because uh, it was the kind of job that was open to me and because it was my family's trade and uh, it was something I could uh, I could do it was something that lay readily to hand but I didn't become a journalist because I had a great yearning to become one it was just the way a blacksmith child becomes a blacksmith how did your your articles as Samuel Marchbanks under that persona how did they begin uh, they began when I was writing on the Peterborough Examiner and uh, I used to write uh, a regular sort of column in addition to the editorial uh, work that I did, uh, which was a sort of regular feature. And it occurred to me that a, a, a diary of every week would be of interest and that it would be an opportunity to comment on things in a way that wasn't normally open to me in the newspaper as a straight, uh, a straight journalist, you see. And what actually suggested it was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's My Day, which seemed to me to be very funny, and I thought I would try a sort of My Day only from my own point of view. And Marchbanks commented on just anything that came up after that? Everything, yes. And the ordinary things of life, which during the war years particularly people liked because uh, it was uh, amusing, and uh, there weren't a great many amusing things during the war. How did you feel about your own relationship with March Banks? I remember in the, the Double Life of Robertson Davies, um, a comment on, uh, on how, what the connection was between yourself and the persona that you created. Well, I didn't really create a persona, you know. That's a thing that you professors insist on saying. I just wrote the column because I had to write it. I had to write it every week. It had to be funny, and people had to like it. And I wasn't creating a persona. I was just earning a living. So you didn't think of Marchbanks as a specific character that you were creating as you wrote it? Not specifically, no. Because that brings me then, I think, to Fifth Business and, and the relationship to, uh, to Dunstable Ramsey mm -hmm. as well. Because the first thing that I noticed when I first read the book a number of years ago was how close Dunst Dunstable Ramsey is to Robertson Davies as a name. And then the background seems very similar to your own experience. Is that just... No, uh, well, no, not really. It was an invented character. Uh, and, of course, uh, he was born in and uh, lived for a time in a small Ontario village, which I did. But I wouldn't have said that it was an attempt to be autobiographical at all. No, it's just your own experience. Like, Mrs. Athelstan is also comparable to Mrs. Ferguson, is it, that you, that, uh, you mention in, in, other, in the other half of Roberts and Davies? Oh, yes. Well, um, there was a family named Ferguson, which had been very prominent in the founding of that village, but uh, there's uh, an important family in every village. Yes, there always is. Yeah. Then, um, because I find that, that that relationship, perhaps not the relationship between yourself and Dunstable, but it's the creation of, of Dunstan Ramsey that is at the core of the book, and that's what I think fascinates all the readers. And that's why I, I was just wondering whether you felt a, spe a special relationship with that character over any other. Uh, well, of course, as he is the narrator of the book, he is particularly important. But uh, I made him the narrator and I made him the way he is in order that he might say certain things which were vital to the story and uh, more than, than just the story, the sort of uh, background and feel of the book. Do you think, uh, you've often mentioned, well, and it's obvious in the book, that he is connected to St. Dunstan. Is it, in a certain sense, a modern recreation of a saint's legend? No. No, not at all. But everybody is, uh, in some way, comparable to some extraordinary figure of the past, very frequently a saint. Uh, we think, you know, that we live extremely individual lives. We really live lives that run in uh, fairly regular patterns. There seem to be a number of characters in the book that, um, that have saintly attributes or, or have a, um, an experience that could be com compared to a saint's legend. But that's just, um, again, you'd say that similar patterns in life? I think that people do that all the time. And if they don't recognize them, they don't recognize them. But I think that they're there. I think that many people have a quite extraordinary spiritual experiences, and they float by them, and they don't recognize them. Just as they, uh, a lot of people live in a world which is full of birds, and they never see any birds. 
They're full of animals, and they don't know any animals except now and again they say, oh, oh that's a dog or something of the sort. They are very much unaware of their surroundings. They're unaware of trees. They're unaware of nature. They're unaware of buildings. And extraordinary people, a number of people, are utterly unaware of their surroundings. And you observe this very strongly in the university. It sometimes amazes me how undergraduates and uh, university um, uh, professors and staff and so on and so forth can be utterly unaware of what is going on around them. And you say to them, did you hear so and so? No, they say, what was that? I said, well, you know, there was a, I would say there was a notice on the notice board in the, uh, in the college or wherever it was for three weeks, didn't you see it? Oh, no, no, they hadn't seen it. It's very difficult to get uh, people, intellectual people, and I say intellectual in quotation marks, to notice anything around them. So is that then one of your purposes as a novelist, to, to make people wake up to what you've seen? An attempt to, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that, that using um, unusual things, unusual people, um, unusual events, do you think that helps in that? Or? People are unusual. Uh, it is sometimes said that the people in my books are peculiar and that they're strange, and I don't think they are. I think they're like the people that I meet all the time. So someone like Liesl is someone that you could meet on the street? Yes. I don't know that you meet her on the street, but you meet her two or three times in a lifetime. Hmm. So you don't think that they're... I've always thought of the characters in the book as extreme because we see them through the way that Dunstan Ramsey sees. Well, uh, partly, but you see they're extreme the way that people say that the characters in books by Dickens are extreme. But if you examine them, you find that they're much more like real people than some dull, realistic uh, figure who appears mm -hmm. in a book whom you forget almost as soon as you've read about him. I know what you mean, because someone like um, <coughs> Uriah Heep is stuck in my mind of all course. my life as a certain type. Of course, and you meet people like that very, very frequently. But uh, Uriah Heep is a distillation. He is an essence of somebody. And I try to make my characters essences of people. So naturally, they seem to be perhaps uh, a little exaggerated, a little extreme, a little larger than life, but their life. I thought that if, if Dunstan Ramsey is, is um, a saint in a certain sense, Magnus Isengrim seems to be the inverse of that, sort of a magus tale. Yes, but you see, I never said Dunstan Ramsey was a saint. No, okay. Well, you said he had, didn't you say he had saintly attributes, though, and, or something to that effect in, in one of your lectures, I think? I don't know whether I did or not. Maybe I'm I was probably you. tormented into saying it by somebody. Well, then, um, but can you, can you avoid it when you look at the pattern of the book and, like, tweaking Liesel's nose with the uh, tongs. Aren't all those patterns constantly suggestive of that, or is that just something to he torment professors? Uh, two girls' noses, Diana, Marfleet, yeah. <coughs> and uh, later on Liesel, one in play and one in anger. But uh, everybody's always tweaking girls' noses. It isn't extraordinary to Ramsey. I just don't know if I, I, don't <laughs> know if I trust that answer. The... Um, Oh, I, I wanted to ask you a few questions about um, your reactions to, to Jung. One thing is that um, I have a quotation here from Jung. I hope it's accurate, and I don't know where I took it. Thought forms, universally understandable gestures, and many attitudes follow a pattern that was established long before man developed a reflective conscious. And I sort of wonder, is, is that um, another part of what you're trying to do in your books, to try and bring that expression into a reflective conscious? Yes, yes. Um, you know, we are uh, animals. We uh, have a kind of uh, discernible and traceable development as animals, and an attempt to neglect or uh, shove away our animal side is, uh, is self-deceiving. As a novelist, I know that, like all novelists, at times that you feel that you're forced into a box by professors and, and academics who are trying to make some kind of pattern out of your book? Well, that attempt to, uh, to make a pattern or to find a pattern is an attempt somehow or other to explain something in a way in which it cannot be explained. If uh, novels were constructed in patterns, there would be more novels than there are. 
uh, because everybody could write one. You find the pattern and then you go to work. But I have uh, examined a good many novels that were written according to patterns. They were all absolutely dead because the pattern must emerge from the work of art. It cannot be imposed upon it. And uh, that is as true of literature as uh, anything else. But it seems to me that the critic then is trying to explain the unexplainable, is that...? Uh, the critic is trying to explain something in terms of himself. And uh, sometimes it is successful, but not always. Because, uh, uh, understandably, critics are uh, very fond of their own patterns and their own insights and attempt to impose them in places where they won't, uh, where they won't fit. But isn't the type of analysis that you find in Jung that kind of pattern? Uh, no, it isn't, because Jung was himself extremely resistant to the idea of patterns, and he insisted that every analysis, for instance, that he conducted with a patient, had to be individual. They were all done in a different way. There was no uh, method, as was the case with Freud, where you began in a particular way and proceeded in a particular way. Freud always began with the earliest recollections of childhood, and worked uh, from that. Uh, Jung began his analyses and his uh, pu pupils and followers do to this day by saying, what is the immediate problem? And then they expand from the immediate problem in any direction that seems fruitful. But the various, um, various terms, the shadow, the anima, are used again and again. That isn't... They are, yes, but they are a kind of shorthand and uh, they're not... Uh, they're not constants. They, you can't equip everybody with all the archetypes the way that in Freud's uh, system you have to equip everybody with an Oedipus complex or you can't get on. Is, it, is Dunstan Ramsey exploring through that same sort of pattern in the, in the novel? Not, uh, not really, no, and I certainly never intended that he, uh, that he should be. Mm -hmm. He encounters certain things in life which millions of people encounter. But uh, that is scarcely a pattern, that is just the fact of being a human creature. Have you ever heard of the, the Book of St. Dunstan, the alchemical treatise? No. Because it's, um, it's, it's only, it doesn't exist as far as I know, but it, it's found in the Renaissance. References to it are found in the rest Renaissance, and it intrigued me to, to see that connection between your book and um, something called the Book of St. Dunstan, because I think that Jung's Psychology of Alchemy and the whole relationship between um, different opposites, men and women, um, good and evil, seems very close to what you're talking about in your book. Um, possibly, yes, but I wasn't conscious of that. No. But the, good, the question of good and evil is very important, though. Yes. How, um, one thing, I find that the, the way that you use good and evil in the book is fascinating, but um, I, and perhaps I'm going too far, but I, I find it difficult to see what the application is to, to life, if one can look at a work of art, at a novel, and kind of abstract a message from it. And um, what are you tell? Are you telling your readers something about good and evil? What I'm not they, giving them any message. You're not giving them any message. No. You're just observing. Do you not uh, find uh, evidence of good and evil in life as you encounter it? I think, yes, one must. Mm. But as in uh, when Padre Blazon um, talks about the need to um, to grasp evil, to come to terms directly mm. with it. But I suppose you would say that's just something that anybody would have to do in any... It's just, uh, you have to do it if you're awake, but a lot of people aren't awake, of course. <laughs> Perhaps I'm not either. No, I, I don't suggest that, but no. uh, uh, a great many people are very resistant to that kind of experience. They seem to think that they are creating the whole of life themselves instead of living in a pattern which is common to hundreds of millions of human beings. Yes, yes, that's very true. Is there any reason why you, you've used um, elements that, that might be termed to be uh, folklore, saints, legends, um, the sculpture, um, or are they just things that happen to... They are uh, elements which are fairly common in, uh, in human life. Uh, if you look behind a great deal of human experience, you'll find something that looks like folklore, or uh, a legend of a saint or something of the sort. Because, as I say, life has not an unlimited number of patterns. And one of the interesting um, things is to see what patterns occur in your own life. 
that uh, have been uh, have appeared elsewhere in various ways. When when you you've said uh, I think in um, the other half of Robertson Davies that for the whole of your life you've been interested in alchemy, and I was, I was wondering, is there any connection between all of these things? Um, elements of knowledge that perhaps in our technological society are rejected or have been rejected, um, and you seem to have turned to them. Is there any substance to that? Yes, I've turned to them for the simple reason that they are rejected, and my contrary and difficult nature persuades me that if the majority of people reject something, there must be something very interesting about it. Uh, they reject it not because it is worthless, but because they can't come to terms with it. And so I want to see what it is. Uh, now, as for alchemy, uh, it is a very great variety of things, like uh, most large subjects. It was, among other things, uh, an attempt to uh, turn base metals into gold. It was also the, the beginning, the initial uh, uh, work in what is now the uh, science of chemistry. And it was a kind of heretical movement because it had a mystical side to it which was uh, concealed from people who were not uh, initiated into our chemical work. And it was also fascinating because it was a kind of uh, metaphor for an exploration of life, an attempt to turn what is base and apparently worthless into what is uh, of great price. And that, I think, is one of the great experiments of a, a fairly well realized and uh, understood life to turn the apparently intractable material of everyday experience into something which is of, uh, of value. So in, in your novel, I think that most people would agree that there is a, an apparent search for a mystical element. Yes. Or at least a reflection of that. Yes. And that's where the alchemy and the other elements come together. Yes, it is. And you see uh, Ramsey, like uh, a great many people and like a very great many Canadians, begins life with a religious upbringing, which he then uh, tends to reject. But he has to come to terms with the fact that uh, there is an element in his life which can only be satisfied by something which it is convenient to call religion, but which is certainly not summed up in the religion of his childhood or of the really rather uh, simple life that he lived up to his 15th year. Mm -hmm. That's one aspect that I found fascinating because I, I um, in my own life, I found exactly the same thing, that you have to come to terms with a religious element eventually. Mm -hmm. And the way that in your novel that you reflect a variety of different approaches to religion, I think fascinating because Amasa Dempster's religion is obviously very limit limiting. Yes. Yes. And um, perhaps is Mary Dempster's religion just too overflowing, too open to, to handle? Uh, she is saintly but she's also somewhat mad. Is there a relationship between those two things? Or Not necessarily, just... but there is in her case. She is uh, uh, charitable beyond the point that is uh, self-preservative. Right. Which very few people are. Yes. But uh, great saints have, uh, have been that way. And uh, that is one of the primary questions of the book. Is she a saint or is she not? Do you think it's an answer that the reader uh, that the reader has to come to? That is uh, something the reader has to come to, and this is something which uh, uh, rather amuses me about my books. People keep saying that they're that they're old-fashioned, and yet they do things that those old-fashioned books never do, and that very few novels do now. They make the reader make certain decisions. Mm -hmm. They have to make a decision as to whether Mary Dempster is a saint or not. They have to make a decision about who or what it was that killed Staunton. And they have to make a decision in the Manticore as to whether David is going to return to his analyst and find himself in a fairly well-patterned way, or is he going to take the other step and uh, go it alone. They're perpetually asked to make decisions so that everybody reads the book in an individual and different way. And I don't think that's very old-fashioned. No, no, I don't think it is. Is it, do you see magic in the in the book as as um, similar to religion, having a similar role to play in the book? Well, it's a, it's a, a, an element in life or in experience 
which I think is inescapable. Most people encounter or have to come to terms with some kind of magical element in some way because things appear in daily life which are inexplicable and you have to uh, decide one way or another what, uh, what makes them the way that they are. And magic is really just effects without uh, apparent causes. And life's full of those. Yeah, I think you're right. Do you, are you, um, have you seen, uh, what's his name, David Henning? Yes, oh yes, I know him a little. Because he impressed me because it seems to me that he's bringing back the um, element of mysticism to, to magic. Because it seems, when I, at least when I remember as a young boy watching magicians on Ed Sullivan or something, there wasn't any mysticism to it. It was just very no, unfair. There was a bad period when uh, magicians were always trying to make themselves primary into comedians. The first rate magician may be amusing, but he's also really mysterious. And there must be a point at which you are puzzled and maybe even a little frightened. Uh, I remember seeing that admirably uh, demonstrated when I was quite a small boy myself by a very fine musician, uh, magician called Blackstone, who had a trick, which I saw him do two or three times, which was interesting. Uh, he did the old magician's trick of pulling a rabbit out of a top hat. And then he uh, asked a child, always a little girl, to come up on the stage. And he invited the child to hold the rabbit in a bag while he wrapped it all very, very carefully and put it into a, a shape. And then he un asked the child to unwrap it, and she unwrapped it, and it was a box of chocolates. And the child always cried. Really? Yes. It was very interesting because it was a sort of, there was, she was slightly frightened of the man who could turn the rabbit into the chocolates. She thought the rabbit was great, and she thought the chocolates were great, but the change was too much for her. It's fascinating, and I was interested that he did it, and he must have gone on doing it all over the country, and mm -hmm. yet the child cried. But he comforted her, he was nice to her, and, uh, and there it was. But it was just that element of fear which was fascinating. Yes. Well, I think that's very, very strong in your novels as mm -hmm. well, especially of Magnus Isengrim. Well, people like to be afraid, and they like to be deluded. Mm -hmm. uh, but they also like to feel as they are with great illusionists on the stage that they're in safe hands. It's not going to go too far. From the first time that I read your novel, Fifth Business, one thing that really bothered me was Libido, Agnes Day, Gloria Monday. It's, it's a cute gimmick. It's a lot of fun. But I don't see how it, it fits the point that you're making in the novel. Well, it's, uh, it's easily explained. Uh, they are real women. But those are not the names. Ramsey was not brought up in a day when you mentioned the names of ladies with whom you had love affairs. He would never do it. And that's why he conceals their names. That's a very simple answer that I never dreamt of. It's well, very logical. Uh, it seems not. Uh, now, I don't know whether people go on blatting and uh, saying, I slept with uh, what's her name last night. If they do, they need a good uh, hit over the head. <laughs> uh, certainly, in Ramsey's day, and a Ramsey kind of person, he would never mention the name of a girl that he'd known in that way. You've said, I think, that um, as you go on, you've realized that as a novelist, you're, you're a moralist. What do you mean by that? Uh, well, I think I went on to explain that uh, a moralist is somebody who looks for uh, for reasons in uh, human behavior and the reasons that crop up repeatedly in my uh, books are things like this, that what happens to you is enormously conditioned by what you are and the way in which you approach life. And in fact, as uh, a man soweth, so shall he also reap. And uh, the people in my books all sow something, and they reap exactly what they have sown. Boy Staunton does, mm -hmm. and Ramsey does, and Eisengrim does, uh, and uh, a great many other characters in uh, novels, uh, these three and others, uh, 
their lives are lived out in exactly that way. You cannot escape what you are, and that's why you've got to be so extraordinarily careful about your your basic attitudes and what you do, because they will come back to you, mm -hmm. and they do. And, said, and that's being a moralist. I mean, if you look at a man destroying himself and say, you're destroying yourself, well, now there, you've done it, and now you're, uh, you're a wreck. That's being a moralist. It doesn't mean that you're going around saying, you ought to be doing this, but you're doing that. It is simply an, uh, an uh, uh, observing patterns of behavior and consequences. Mm -hmm. The stone is, is such a, um, a major part of those consequences. Um, is there any reason why you, why you chose one object to carry through the book, or did it just happen, it just seemed right? Because I, when I first read it, I thought, and I don't know Jung well enough, but didn't Jung, doesn't Jung in his autobiography talk about having a small stone that he keeps all his life? Oh yes, he did, but that was a quite different thing. And I don't think I was aware of that uh, at the time that I uh, wrote that book, because I don't think that Dr. Jung's autobiography had been published at that time. But certainly it had no relationship to it. But you see, the stone uh, is interesting uh, because it has uh, a number of qualities. Um, it was the evil element in uh, Staunton's act, which pro set going a whole 60 years of consequences. It was also the thing which eventually accompanied Staunton when he died. But a thing which a lot of people overlook is that it is something which Ramsey picked up and kept for 60 years. And what does that tell you about Ramsey? He presents himself in one way, but one of the things you have to be aware of, and I'm sure you are because you're a professional uh, teacher of literature and you know that when you get a novel or a narration in the first person, you always have to be watchful that the narrator may be a liar. Now this comes up in Henry James, it comes up in Conrad mm -hmm. again and again and again. And people frequently ask me about Dunstan Ramsey as though he were, uh, everything he said was to be weighed as absolute gospel truth. But he is a man just like Staunton, and he is a man like Dempster. And you have to always remember who is talking. And they, I think it is chilling, but I don't find many people who seem to be chilled by it that after Mrs. Dempster had been hit by the stone and uh, Dunstan helped to take her home, on the way back he stopped for a moment and picked up the stone and it stayed in his house all the time he was at the war and when he came back it was the thing that he went to get before he allowed the house to be sold and uh, its uh, contents dispersed and he kept it for 60 years. To me. as a vengeful man. People ask me if Dunstan Ramsey is a saint, but what saint behaves like that? Well, I'm, I'm never too sure, though, um, whether he keeps it because out of vengeance or he keeps it out of his own guilt as being an element in, in uh, Mary Dempster's destruction. The two are not incompatible. No, I suppose you're right. Yeah. He well, keeps it because it is vital to his life. Yeah. Uh, when, you, when you talk about um, morality, one character I always find fascinating, and quite a minor character, is Surgeoner, because on the one hand, he's part of that, that mystical morality in his experience with Mary Dempster, but on the other hand, he's part of that very preaching, almost sort of a Massa Dempster morality in the way he acts in his mission. Yes, and he's also something that is much more akin to the illusionist than uh, people generally notice, because you see, he tells that uh, long and very I think, sad story of his life to uh, Ramsey. And then Ramsey is very much moved and gives him some money. He says, and so you see now how prayers are answered, Mr. Ramsey. Yeah. He's a bit of an illusionist too. And uh, Ramsey's been getting after him because he says, you tell simple stories about widows who give you a penny and you buy a tract and it redeems a man. Who do you expect to believe that? But uh, Surgeon knows exactly what he's doing. And he knows what he's doing when he tells that story, which may not be true, but which produces effects of truth. He's a much more uh, complicated character than he appears on the surface. When, when you talk about Surgeoner, one thing that I always, I think of is Surgeoner's position as a missionary um, gives him a very social position. And to tie a few things together, before you mentioned that um, many people talk about you as an old-fashioned novelist, one thing that I find very new-fashioned is that it seems to me that 
the old-fashioned novel is very much concerned about society and to a certain extent sociology, whereas yours is very much in the lines of what Jung called individuation. Oh, yes. Very much yes. the individual. Yes. Is there a, the social concern as well in it, or is that...? Not particularly. Uh, you see, uh, I am, as you know, deeply interested in Dr. Jung's thought, and uh, his message is an extraordinarily simple one. If you want to save the world, start by saving yourself first. And that's uh, the way to go about it, and that's what the characters are, one way or another, attempting to do in those books. So if there is a social comment, one thing that, that comes to mind is, is the impression one gets of small-town Canada, then that's very much of a secondary thing. I think so, yes, and it is a thing which I think is now gone, but it was very real at the time that Dunson Ramsey was a boy. Uh, you don't find villages like that now. No. I was born in one, and I know a lot about them, but uh, not like that anymore. For instance, the village in which I was born uh, was at that time about uh, 10 or 12 miles away from the county town, which is quite a big place. But you didn't get there very often because there weren't many cars and people didn't just drive 10 or 12 miles readily. The town in which I was born was the center for quite a large agricultural district. It was the, the well, it was the village really, but they always called it the town. Now it's just a spot on the road and uh, the real town is the county town. We've changed all that, but in my day, that was uh, the way that uh, these areas worked. It seems, though, to, to go, by, go beyond the novel, that in many ways, even today, perhaps through that process of individuation, but Canadians have to get beyond that restrictive thing they still feel, I think. Yes. Canadians are very restrained yes. people. Yes, uh, and of course, uh, sometimes they delude themselves about having escaped it. Yes. Yes. It is, uh, you can find that sort of spirit in big places, too. One last thing I want to mention is that just in the time that I've encountered you, and of course through your novels, I can see that you've got a great sense of fun. Um, and I remember you saying in, in one of your um, essays or lectures that um, people have accused you of having a sense of humor. Um, which I just, well, how do you mean that? I mean, what's the problem that they perceive? A great many people do not like a sense of humor. Uh, they think it is threatening. They like people who make jokes, and they like people who explode little jokes as a sort of a social gambit in order to make conversation pleasing or something. But the idea of a sense of humor which may obtrude at any time and under any circumstances, they do not like. And uh, a sense of humor is never extremely common, nor is it very popular because it is, uh, it is anarchic. There seems, maybe I'm wrong, but there seems to me to be less obvious humor in the Deptford trilogy than there is in the Salterton trilogy. Is that just my perception? Uh, I think you're right, of course. Uh, it's not uh, so obviously written as comedy. But uh, in the Salterton books, the last one, The Mixture of Frailties, is moving towards mm -hmm. a much more uh, restrained attitude towards uh, the characters in the book. and. Uh, uh, life generally, but I think you find in the Deptford Trilogy, if you read it as a whole, it is, uh, the spirit is comic, it is optimistic, it is, uh, it all goes through some dark places, but it doesn't uh, end up going running downhill, and I think that that is what the comic spirit is. Well, that's something that I hope we can all find through your novel. Thank you very much. Thank you.
justice. <laughs> Crime and punishment the same all over the world, here as in my country. Forgive my butting in, sir. English justice isn't the same. It differs in many ways from the justice of any other country. I'd like to show you some of our courts and tell you something about our system of law. Though it's a very big subject, it began a long way back. A thousand years ago, there were many different ways of settling disputes. One of the most common was trial by ordeal. The Normans introduced trial by combat, in which the accused fought it out with the accuser. A big step towards establishing a sound system of justice was Magna Carta, which confirmed the right of every Englishman to a fair trial by his equals. Down the passage of time, English law has slowly and steadily developed. Early in its history, two main trends became apparent. The law drawn from the accumulating judgments pronounced in the courts of the past, this is known as precedent and largely governs civil cases, and statute law, based on acts passed by Parliament in response to changing public opinion. This mainly governs criminal cases. The past has laid a trail of wisdom, a guide to present justice and a signpost to its future. These modern books of law are the fruits of generations of striving for a code of fairness. Their roots spring direct from the lives of the ordinary people of the land. Here's a modern magistrate's court in a typical English town. You, the public, have right of entry here. Let's go in and see what justice looks like. Next case, John Robert Simpson, Your Worship. Case of cattle straying on the highway is here in court. This way, John Robert Simpson. John Robert Simpson, you are summoned with being the owner of cattle found on the 5th of January last... That man now speaking is the clerk to the magistrates. He is usually a solicitor and advises the court on legal points. He's just finished reading out the summons. Do you plead guilty or not guilty to the charge? The defendant has now to plead guilty or not guilty to a charge of being the owner of cattle found straying on the highway. He's a countryman and not used to court procedure. The clerk will obviously have to make him conform to the rules. On all technical matters, the clerk is the guide to magistrates who will eventually make their decision. Yes, yes, all right, all right. Doesn't this fellow understand the correct procedure? He's a bit upset, I'll explain. Before the case goes any further, Mr. Simpson, you must formally submit a plea of guilty or not guilty. Reckon he says not guilty, then. These small-town magistrates have the power to deal with a wide variety of minor offences. They cannot hear a case alone, for they are not professional legal men. They are ordinary men and women, local citizens with a good record of public service. This service, vital to a nation's social and domestic peace, is, in England, voluntary and unpaid. This young man is the principal witness. He's the motorist who made the original complaint to the police. Holding the Bible, he takes an oath to tell the truth. We'll repeat the words of the card, please. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I give to the court shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In this case, the police inspector acts as prosecutor. In our country, the prosecutor has not in any sense inquisitorial powers, as is customary in some parts of the world. Here, his duty is to lay before the court the whole of the facts as they are known to the prosecutor, including those favorable to the defendant. Now the defendant has his chance to ask the witness any questions which may turn the scales to his advantage. Didn't I tell you how them cattle happened to stray? No, your actual words to beware. Some mischief-making fool or other must have broken the fence. That's all I want to ask you. I don't re-examine. Right, Mr. Burton, you may go now. Both sides are finished with the witness. The chairman of the bench will now explain to the defendant his rights. You may elect to give evidence on your own behalf, but it's my duty to warn you that if you do go in the witness box, you'll be liable to cross-examination by the prosecution. Oh. And supposing I stays here and says what I has to say? You may make a statement which may be taken into consideration, 
but you'll not be placed on oath. Why, then I'll stay here. He's made his choice. He'll stay out of the witness box and thus avoid the trained questions of people more accustomed to legal proceedings than himself. All defendants have the right to speak in their own defence, either from the witness box on oath, or from the dock, or, as in this case, from the floor of the court. Remember that here, as in all other English courts, the defendant is innocent until he is proved guilty. It is up to the prosecution to prove its case. How was I to know some mischief-making fool had broken down my fence, eh? I can't be in all places at once, can I? That's our idea of a fair hearing. As a matter of interest, the maximum penalty in that case is a five shilling fine. But the same sort of procedure is followed whether the case is of a minor nature or a serious criminal charge. They all begin in a court like that. Now there goes a more serious case. That young fellow has been committed for trial by a higher court. He'll be held in custody until the next quarter sessions. The procession is the prelude to these courts in some towns. First comes the sergeant of mace, the permanent official of the court. Behind him comes the mayor of the town, who sits on the bench as a sign of grace, but takes no active part. Quarter sessions are usually presided over by a chairman with legal qualifications. He is supported on the bench by local magistrates. And barristers attend to represent the Crown as prosecution or as defence counsel for the accused. In England, legal aid is free if the prisoner satisfies the court he has not the means to pay for his defence. The great difference about a quarter sessions court is that there will be a jury. They are waiting now inside. Twelve good men and true, as they are sometimes called, drawn from every walk of life. Before each quarter session, the names of the next people due for service on a jury are chosen from a record kept by the local clerk of the peace. The summonses go out to ratepayers and to any citizens of respected character. In country towns, they are delivered personally by the official of the court, the sergeant at mace. In London, they arrive by post. A jury summons cannot be cast aside. Attendance at court on the specified day is compulsory, unless a special excuse can be produced that will satisfy the court. Business, or plans for pleasure, have to be set aside for that day, or even longer, perhaps, if the case lasts more than one day. No money is paid to the jury in criminal cases. The service is regarded as a public duty. These quite ordinary people must assemble at the appointed time and place, and their decision must be unanimous in all criminal cases. Here at the Central Criminal Court, commonly known as the Old Bailey, they are listening to the evidence in a case of murder. Face downward, sir, with the uh, right arm underneath her. You said it was about five minutes after the sound was shot. Had a crowd gathered? A man's life is at stake. In this court, the basic principles of English law can be seen. Impartiality of the judge, Free defence by barristers, if needed. The right of trial by jury. Presumption of innocence of the prisoner. And trial in open court. The role of a judge is to guide and advise throughout the trial. He is almost invariably a famous lawyer with an extremely wide range of experience in criminal jurisdiction. Witnesses for the prosecution and the defence are examined by learned counsel. Medical. The prosecutor has called this witness to the box and will try to get further facts from her. After taking an oath similar to the one taken by the witness in the magistrate's court, she awaits the first question of the prosecuting counsel. Notice how careful he is to avoid putting a leading question, a question already containing the answer. Now, Miss Coombs, I want you to cast your mind back over a short period of time. Do you recognize the man you saw in the hotel corridor on the night in question? Yes. 
Is he present in court? Yes, he's the man in the dock. On that occasion, the one you referred to earlier in your evidence, was he carrying anything? Yes. What was he carrying? A revolver. Thank you, that is all. You'll notice the prosecuting counsel framed his questions so that the witness herself gave the facts. Are you certain of that? I think so. It was a badly lit corridor, I believe. It looked like a revolver. Might it not have been a small piece of metal? A wrench, for instance? Well, I... I thought it was a revolver. Thank you. That is a good example of our cross-examining method. Without unfair pressure, the barristers have one information which may sway the whole course of this trial. I think the jury are getting a little doubtful. You see, our system has the advantage of examining an important fact in the light of 12 widely differing viewpoints. This case is exciting wide public interest and is covered by newspaper reporters. A trial may be reported word for word in the press, but no opinion can be printed until after a case is decided. There goes some copy for an early edition. Now we'll soon know. The judge is summing up. If you have the slightest doubt as regards this all-important fact, it is your duty to acquit the accused. This is sometimes known as the benefit of the doubt, but it is not a benefit, it is a right. You may feel, as two of the Crown witnesses would appear to feel, that there can be no doubt that the accused was indeed the man they saw emerging from room 43 at that particular moment. It moment. is for these 12 ordinary men and women to make the decision of life or death. Bear in mind that according to English law, it is for the prosecution, first, last, and all the time, to prove beyond doubt the guilt of the prisoner. It is not for the prisoner to prove his innocence. When weighing up the aspects of the case you just heard, you must remember that the evidence of the prisoner should be given the same consideration as the evidence of any other witness. And finally, members of the jury, I must impress upon you that the judgment of this man in no way depends on me. You are the judges of the facts, and you alone. That is all the assistance I can give you in the matter. Will you consider your verdict? You will no doubt wish to retire to your room. I swear by Almighty God that I will well and truly keep... This man is the court usher, an official with similar functions to the sergeant at Mace. He promises on oath that he will lock the jury in a private room and see that no one influences them. Without leave of the court. Silence! Guilty or not guilty, the answer is behind that door. A man's life rests in the hands of these 12 people. They may be gone 10 minutes, an hour, two hours. It may be any length of time. For whatever the decision, it must be unanimous. Meanwhile, the leading figures of the trial have to wait.
the jury are returning and will answer to their names. They have, in fact, been absent three hours. Whatever they have decided, it will be the decision of them all. Richard Lee? Yeah. Herbert Blanford? Yeah. Charles Neal? Yeah. Edward Scott? Yeah. Kathleen Wright? Yeah. William Holding? Yeah. Silence! Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. And do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty of murder? Not guilty. Let the prisoner be discharged. Not guilty. The prisoner will be immediately discharged and can never be charged for the same offence again. Now, if the verdict had been guilty, you would have witnessed a very different scene and a custom going back many decades. Are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. And do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. And that is the verdict of you all? Yes. Prisoner at the bar, do you stand convicted of murder? Have you anything to say why sentence of death should not be passed upon you? Oh, yea, oh, yea, oh, yea. My lords, the King's justices do strictly charge and command all persons to keep silence while sentence of death is passed upon the prisoner at the bar upon pain of imprisonment. God save the King. Prisoner at the bar, you stand convicted of murder. The sentence of the court upon you is that you be taken from this place to a lawful prison and thence to a place of execution and that you be there hanged by the neck until you be dead, and that your body be afterwards buried within the precincts of the prison in which you shall have been confined before your execution. And may the Lord have mercy on your soul. Amen. In England, a death sentence does not necessarily mean a prisoner will be executed. A convicted man can appeal on a variety of grounds to the Court of Criminal Appeal in the Law Courts. Then, if he still believes he has just cause, with the leave of the Attorney General, he can appeal on a point of law to the House of Lords. And finally, the Home Secretary can advise the King to exercise the prerogative of mercy. According to this, the prisoner may either be reprieved and his death sentence commuted to penal servitude, or he is given a free pardon. These aspects of our legal system are fundamental to our way of life. English justice has its roots in concepts and ideals that are centuries old. It is a living thing, molded and shaped by time, but growing and adapting itself to the conscience of each successive age. <laughs>